Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Neil. I'm a data scientist at the African Legal Information Institute, which is at the University of Cape Town. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there myself tonight, um, but uh, Danielle, who's there, will have just taken you through uh, the South African legal position uh, as it applies to discrimination. And what I'm going to do in this video is show you the demonstration that I would have done um, which is about how bias can enter into machine learning algorithms, uh, sometimes in unexpected ways, um, and tie that up as well with uh, what you've already seen about the legal position in South Africa. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to just show you a fairly simple um, machine learning model. It's a decision tree. They're quite easy to illustrate and understand. Um, and we've got some data on credit credit risk rating, uh, which is German credit risk data that I got from Kaggle. Uh, quite a small data set, um, but uh, the idea is just to illustrate with a simple example um, the different ways in which bias can, can enter into, into machine learning algorithms. So let's jump into it. Okay, so I, I have here a process in RapidMiner. Uh, which is software for making uh, for doing data mining in a in a graphical interface. Um, so it's a bit easier. I don't know how many people in the audience are data scientists or developers, um, but in any event, this is uh, this is good for demonstrations uh, to see uh, to be able to see what we're doing. So um, so as I said, uh, we have some data here, which is credit risk data. Um, it's information about uh, people, different features, um, about them and their finances, uh, and then information about whether they were considered to be a credit risk or not. So uh, we're going to have a quick look um, at that data and see what it, what it looks like. Um, so i just read that in. So this is what that data looks like. We've got the first column is just the, the row numbers that they assign. Uh, then it's got the age of the person who was applying, uh, their sex, uh, then their, their job level. Um, these labels in these columns here uh, are not the ones that the banks actually used. They were translated into something a bit more understandable. Um, so these are just job levels. Here's their housing, whether they own it, whether it's free or whether they're renting. Um, then their savings accounts have been given a ranking um, of how much they had in their savings account. And the same with the checking account. Um, then there's the amount of credit that they have. I think this is in euros. Um, and then there's the duration. This is in months for how long they've had that credit. Um, here's the purpose that they're applying for. Uh, and then at the end, whether they were rated as a good credit, uh, a good person to offer credit to or, or, or not. Um, so what we're gonna do is put this into a model um, to try and predict from these attributes whether a person is a good uh, good person to give credit to or not. Um, as you can see, we already have two uh, attributes of people here which are listed grounds, um, as Danielle would have ex explained before. So already we can see that there, there might be some bias entering into this model. So let's have a look. Um, the first thing we're going to do is just get rid of that one column at a one which was the, the row number, um, because we already have a row number. Um, so I'm just going to grab, oh, this isn't linked. Oopsie. So I'm going to grab uh, at a one, and then invert selection. So it's going to take everything except that. So I'm just taking it out. Um, then what I need to do, so this is labeled training data, um, their, their risk uh, classification is, is the outcome that we want to predict. Um, so we're just going to set the role of that, that risk column to be, that's our label. Um, so we just use this thing here and we say that risk is our label. Um, so that'll set that. And now this is ready, we can put it into a model. Uh, as I said, we're just going to be using a decision tree. Uh, it's very easy to, to visualize and to see the output. Um, so yeah, I'm going to 
I'm not going to pre-prune this tree. I'm going to let it overfit quite a bit. We'll just limit it to eight. Um, because, yeah, the amount of credit turns out to be very influential. So we wanted to split a bit more um, and see if it, if it can go a bit more granular. So if we link that up and we run that model, this is the decision tree that we get. So what this says is that if your credit amount is more than 15,900, then you're a credit risk. Uh, if it's less than that, but you've had it for more than 66 months, then you're also a credit risk. Um, now there's another split on, on credit amount. Um, so you can see there's a few splits on credit amount, which means we're overfitting because this should probably be a linear relationship. Um, but anyhow, uh, on this side here, it's now splitting by age. So that's one of our listed grounds. It's already using that as a decision-making factor. Um, so that means there's discrimination. And if, if it can't be shown to be fair for some reason, uh, then within South African law, uh, that, that that would be an issue. Um, and on this side, yeah, it goes credit amounts as well and then age again. So the naive approach to sort of saying, well, how can we make this this model not biased based on based on age um, uh, is to just say, well, let's take that out of the feature set. Um, and this is what many people uh, think that, you know, you need to do in order to make algorithms, uh, you know, in order to remove bias from algorithms. Um, so what you would do then so I'm going to show you how this would work. Um, let's take out ATA1 again, and let's take out 6 and also age, because these are listed grounds. So we say, well, we're just not going to have those in our feature set. The model won't know what the person's age is. It won't know what the person's sex is. Um, and this is what a lot of people say when they, when they build models and they say it's not biased. They say, well, it doesn't know these things about the person. Um, so let's look at what that would look like. So if we run that, then now we get this tree and you can see it's not using age and it's not using sex in order to figure out whether someone is a good or a bad credit risk. Um, and so on the face of it now, it doesn't appear to have any bias. Uh, what Danielle would have spoken to you about as well, though, is indirect discrimination, which is where you aren't explicitly uh, differentiating between people based on a listed ground, but you're doing it based on something which is correlated with a listed ground. Um, so maybe for example it turns out that uh, people who are married uh, tend to have a very good checking account balance uh, but people who are unmarried uh, prefer to keep their, their liquid assets in the money market um, instead of their checking account and so you end up even though you aren't looking at marital status uh, you you might still be discriminating between people based on marital status even just by looking at the checking account status for example so one way we can investigate this is just to look at our input data and see what correlations are there. So what I'm going to pull up here is a correlation matrix. Um, and I'm just going to copy over that same input data again. And let's have a look at, at what's happening uh, with the data we've got here. Now maybe one thing I should mention is that in this case we can't check for something like marital status because we don't have that information at all. Um, what we do have though uh, is age and sex so we can check for those um, and so there's questions there about you know probably if you're building a model for something like credit risk rating probably you do need to get some information about how it is treating something like marital status um, even if that's just a small sample to uh, you know to see whether or not uh, you're discriminating based on attributes that you might not even know about um, if it is a listed ground so that's also something else to consider but for now, uh, what we've got here is age and sex. Um, I think this correlation matrix is quite computationally expensive. Um, so we can have a look what, well, firstly, we should say, well, data, but you can also, with most algorithms, you can see, well, how influential are they? Um, and yeah, like uh, credit amount, duration, and checking account is what was used to make these splits. Um, so those are those were the influential ones in the end. Um, so we can look at something like uh, duration and say what's the correlation. You can see it's got 0, 0.08 one correlation with um, sex. So it's not it's not massive, but there is a correlation between how long people have had uh, their loans and and their sex um, as captured here. So uh, you know how high it needs to be, I think. Danielle, as she explained, 
Uh, that's not something that the courts have, have explicitly stated, um, but it's something that depends on the impact, right? So it's like, is the effect of looking at the duration of the loan going to result in an impact that's, that's discriminatory uh, on the basis of sex? Um, and, and that's the question. But looking at what the correlations are uh, can help to show you how, how bias can be entering into models even if on the face of them they don't appear to have um, those listed grounds as, as criteria or as features of the, of the training data. Um, yeah, and then the, the last thing to consider as well is that, um, you know, Danielle also spoke about uh, intersectionality and how uh, sometimes the combination of different listed grounds uh, can be something that, that uh, you know, a model can be biased against. So over here, we're only looking at age and sex in isolation. And it might be that something has a very low correlation um, with, with, with age and with sex individually, but maybe there's people or above a certain age and over a certain sex uh, where that combination uh, has a very strong correlation with, with some of the features that we're looking at. And that's a way and it can be very difficult to spot. Um, and it's, it's how bias can enter into these algorithms um, against particular groups at the intersection um, of, of different listed grounds. Uh, and so what, what you can look at as well and, and what should be looked at is not just age and sex in isolation or any of the listed grounds in isolation, but also whether there's correlations with particular combinations of, of age and sex and gender and race and marital status and so forth. Um, so yeah, I hope that was somewhat informative. Um, just a quick demo to show you these are the different ways in which bias can enter into these algorithms and sometimes it's not obvious or it's not clear from the face of it um, but the, the resulting model that you've created can, can be discriminating and uh, as Danielle would have explained it's, it's then the burden of proof is on the person who's developed that model um, to be able to, to say that it's fair at least in uh, legally speaking. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you are data scientists or developers um, but this can maybe also give you an idea if you are building models of some of the things that you can look at to make sure that the models you're building are fair um, and that you aren't letting bias enter into uh, the algorithms that you're creating. Um, this was quite quite service level and quite simple as well. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to demonstrate the basic ideas um, of how bias can enter into, into machine learning algorithms. Cool, I'll hand back over to Danny then to finish the presentation.